Bible to Nehemiah chapter 4. And this will be our third in the series of the Nehemiah Sunday PM services series. And we'll finish up in June regardless, 14 chapters. So again, we're not trying to do a verse-by-verse study here, but we'll basically cover three chapters tonight. So we'll find Nehemiah 4. And uh, while we're waiting on David to get back, kind of the review is, of course, Nehemiah found out that the homeland is still decimated, and he be- becomes instantly uh, moved by that. Uh, the next sermon, we find out the king notices that Nehemiah is just, by his own countless, was, uh, uh, something was wrong with him. And then Nehemiah just drops it on him and says, look, uh, my, my homeland, and, and, and the area that Nehemiah lived at that point was about 500 miles uh, east of, uh, of what would be Jerusalem in about what is modern day Iraq. So if you looked at a map and you, you looked at Jerusalem and then you kind of went east 500 miles, you would see, uh, you would see basically uh, the distance. I guess it would be the distance of being central North Carolina to probably east or western Tennessee, something, some distance about like that. So anyway, then he begins to um, take some people with him and they kind of look at the place. That, you know, the V8s are still down. The stones, there's rubble everywhere, and Nehemiah says, we need to fix this. So they begin to build, gate by gate by gate, wall by wall by wall, everybody's building. So we're going to look at chapter 4 here, and uh, if you have your out, your uh, bulletin there, we'll read the first eight verses of chapter 4. And uh, we're still waiting on David to come back. I just don't want him to get back here and have a week spell. What do you think, Miss Peggy? Somebody need to go check on him? All right, we'll let, is he coming? All right, here we go. All right. All right, we're just making sure. Okay. All right, so notice verses 1 through 8 here of, uh, of uh, chapter 4 of Nehemiah. It says, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth or angry and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews, notice how he's kind of using terms to, to, to deride them, feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stone out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, even that which, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Now, you know, that's obviously that's a mocking statement. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Now notice that. We see from the listing here that they're basically mocking the people of God, but when you look here and realize that ultimately here's where it all comes back to. Uh, it's speaking about here, Nehemiah is speaking about, he says, look, uh, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. It's talking about God himself. Verse 6, so built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together, and to the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very, then they were very wroth. In other words, uh, they were starting to complete the project. Verse 8, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. So you see here, obviously here's the work of God going, and any time there's a work of God, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, sometimes it's in, in a bigger um, form or fashion, uh, maybe bigger organization in this case you've got these men getting an army together and and it's interesting because these people really are not interested in Jerusalem at all in fact when you look at the titles here some of these connections they're not Jews anyway but when they heard the wall was going up and it made them very angry there in verse 7 and then the Bible says they wanted to fight and uh, get it organized and in verse 8 it says and to hinder it you know there's always like this sometimes there's maybe not uh, a lot of action, sometimes it's just a hindrance. And obviously it began with them making fun of them, uh, these feeble Jews. They mocked them, the Bible says. 
And then they even said, look, if they build a wall and a fox was able to jump up on top of it, imagine this building this massive wall. It wouldn't be a wall like the one at Jericho, but still a big wall designed for protection. But imagine someone saying, well, if a little fox was to jump up on that wall, that fox would fall down because basically they don't even know what they're doing or the quality is so shoddy that uh, this thing would fall down anyway. So there's all kinds of ways in which the, the work of God could be hindered or could be, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it gets into people's minds, all right? So notice chapter 6, verse 3. Chapter 5 is about those some internal problems where people started uh, charging the people for food and basic things, making money off the situation. We're not going to deal with that. That was an internal situation apart from these, these two men and then another fellow that comes into place too. All right, so notice chapter 6, verse 3. Uh, let's actually we'll read down to verse 3 from verse 1. Now, it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah, and here's the other fellow, and Geshem the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein. So in other words, everything was completed, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. So this was not a meeting to really get anywhere. This was basically something to cause a problem. Look at verse 3. I love this. This is a verse I remember from Bible college days when I studied this actually in a, in a college setting. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? whilst I leave it and come down to you. And that's, a, that's the attitude you have to have. Sometimes we get distracted by the things. It could be anything from where the devil tries to tell you things like, uh, let's say, have you ever been bothered by Satan, him telling you you're not even saved? Have you ever, you ever had that come to your head? If you're saved, you probably have. And try to tell you that. And then you exhaust yourself trying to figure that one out. And in the meantime, you, uh, you're not able to do the things you need to do. I believe there's people that have literally fought with that so long that they never were any good to anybody else because all the attention was on them. Not that they were being selfish, but imagine if I said to somebody, we'll use Mike again because he's here and he's a good sport, but imagine if I said to Mike, I said, Mike, uh, you want to go out with me? We're going to go uh, knock some doors, go try to visit some people. You want to go with me? Well, I would, preacher, but you know what? I'm, I'm still struggling with, that, with me being saved. I really don't know that. I don't think it'd be right for me to go out and try to when somebody else, when uh, I don't even know. And I believe there's people that have done that. I believe there's people that have said, I don't have a right or I don't feel worthy, if you please, because in my head, I don't have it all figured out. Look, it's real simple here. You go to the Word of God, you tell the Holy Spirit. Now, you tell me, if the Bible tells you that you're saved, then you say, God, there it is. I'm going to go ahead and settle that right here because the devil is always a liar. And here's the thing. In this case here, what ends up happening, they want to bring Nehemiah down from the wall and say, let's go and have a meeting. They, they weren't trying to have a meeting to arrive at any conclusions. All they wanted to do was get the work to stop, to get him uh, somehow unsettled, and, and that way if you can do that, then uh, you, know, you, you can do some damage. Sometimes you're just going to have the attitude that he said here. This is the Holy Spirit writing a book, and Nehemiah is a great, great leader but he says, look, I'm not coming down off the wall. I'm doing a great work where I'm at. I'm not coming down. So all that to say, whatever the devil tries to plague you with, it might be your past. Look, if you've asked God to forgive you of something, if you've got something that's in your past, you say, you, you, you bring the devil to the word and say, look, devil, here's what it says. I'm going to go do a great work, and I'm not going to spend my time trying to figure out something, spend months and years when the answer God has given me and give that thing to God. And in this case right here, this is just nothing more than an example of people trying to stop the work, to hinder the work, to keep the work from going forward. And he says, look, I'm doing a great work. So figure out if you're doing a great work. If you're uh, doing something for God, that's always a great work. So he said, I cannot come down, and I'm just not going to do that. And then notice verse 9 here, verse 9 of that same chapter. He says, for they all made us afraid, saying, their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. So Nehemiah, the leader, obviously knew that though Nehemiah was a strong leader, he was affected by these things. 
But imagine other people who may not be as strong and, and, and look into the leader. Everybody was looking to see what Nehemiah was going to do. Nehemiah, if we're no other reason, says, I'm staying on the wall because people, if they see me kind of give in, then certainly the work will, will, will cease. And he says, look, God, I'm coming to you. Strengthen our hands because there's people that are afraid. Look, courage is not the absence of fear. If you think, Lord, why do I think things and why, do, why am I afraid? Because the devil wants you to feel that way. The devil is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he can devour. The, the roar of the lion, the, the fear and all of that. Look, if you look at the disciples, they were fearful. But what you've got to do is say, look, God gave me a command. I'm going to take this promise and I'm going to go with it. It doesn't mean that, that fear necessarily is going to be dispelled, but it does mean that you can conquer it by doing the job that God wants you to do. And uh, so Nehemiah prays, strengthen our hands, and may we keep going forward. Then notice verse 16 here, actually verse 15. Um, and we could go back a few more, but we'll go back to 15. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month Elul in 50 and 2 days. It's pretty good. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes. That means they were even angrier than they ever were. For they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. You know, it's hard for me to imagine that um, there are people that will fight against the people of God, even the work of God, and yet will still do it despite that. Here's people, you would think when you see this verse right here, that they said, okay, the wall is finished. It's done. And the Bible says in their own minds, they said, you know why this was finished? Because God helped them to finish it. Now you would think after that, then you would think, well, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, they're going to be right with God. There'll be no more problems. And man, they've got it all figured out. It just doesn't work that way. There can be people that can see it being the work of God, which tells me that if people knows it's the work of God and yet still fight, then they're fighting against God. And uh, the, the bonus of this or the blessing of this is if they perceive that to be the work of God and God's done it, then, then that's, that's the blessing. We want the work here to be of God. We want God to be the one who comes in and does what he does. And when you, when you look at some of these timetables and you look at some of the timetables of the work that was done throughout the Bible, uh, like we said in the prayer room, uh, things don't always happen on our schedule. We want things like right now, God. We make a prayer, God, do it now. And if it don't happen now, then somehow you didn't answer our prayer. God has something in the Bible called due season, due time. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you faint not. You know, when I look at Moses, Moses spent 40 years being a prince, and then he got thrown out into the wilderness because he was afraid of being killed by Pharaoh. He spent 40 years, what we would call almost wasted just keeping a bunch of sheep, not doing anything really. Then all of a sudden he meets God at the burning bush experience, goes into Egypt, delivers the people out of, uh, out of Egypt with God's help, of course. And then he spends another 40 years kind of wandering around with people that uh, God says, we'll just waste these people away, but the people that will go in will be people that believe me. So timetable sometimes we get thrown off by, but here's what we want. We want the hand of God on the work. We want God to do the work. So there was hindrance, there was heckling, but you know what? But there was this headway that was continuing. And, uh, and there were these victories that were being wrought. And the next step, of course, we'll look at it next Sunday night, but, but, but they, were, they were not satisfied with that. The work was finished. Then they had to build the internal part, all, all the dwellings within the walls. You've got a wall. The book of Ezra talks about a temple being built. That was built, and that basically saw, uh, had the same opposition uh, and, and you'll see a pattern. I won't give it away now, but here's the thing. We all have to decide if it's the work of God, then let's go forward. You know, I noticed that uh, when I did a devotion not too long ago with uh, King Saul, King Saul chased David to kill him and convinced people that he's basically like an enemy of God. And yet when Saul really toward the end of his life before he died he realized he says look what I'm doing is I'm fighting against God God took the kingdom from me Saul said David is going to be the next king I mean you know he is guiltless and yet Saul kept pursuing kept pursuing till finally he came to the point where he says you know what uh, I'm not going to do it and then Saul's life is ended 
his son's life is ended in the battle, and that was just a horrible thing with the Philistines. They kill them, and just a horrible, horrible situation. So the end result is you don't want to fight against the work of God. Even in the book of Acts where they said these Pharisees, Sadducees, these, these religious people said, are we going to shut down these people? And one of them really was not on the side of God's people, but he did say, I'll tell you what, though, we might be fighting against God. And fighting against God is not a good thing. So you never want to fight against God. You want to fight uh, with God. So it's a wonderful story because Nehemiah, he hung in there. And the lessons, of course, and I'm almost finished here because I want to get you out of here. But, but I want you to think about a man that had a, had a great job who could have said, you know what, it's, it's too late to rebuild. And it was, it was a long time it lay in ruins, but Nehemiah was moved. And that first moving was God moving. And if God's moved on your heart to do something for God, and it's within the realms of what God has provided, then you know what? Then, then God will make it all fit together. And Nehemiah, was, God had the leadership there, and God brought the materials. Even the materials that were used, even the Gentile king provided that, even provided some safe passage and You'll find out next week some things that were being done to, to continue to shut the work down. So all I can say tonight is this. Just realize that if God's got his hand on you, God's got his hand on the work, you keep going forward. And you're going to see something happen. And I believe that. I've seen God do it. Here's a wonderful story here. I've seen other examples in the Bible sometimes. It, it seems like when, 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 and then God says, just be patient. Because I know this. The Bible says that tribulation worketh patience. And sometimes one of the hardest things to do is to wait. 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 Why have I got to wait, God? Why don't you do something now? I'm getting really frustrated. God says, you wait because you're going to grow and you're going to learn. Hey, one of these days you're going to look back and you're going to say, I remember the days where I, where, I, where I continued on to serve God. I remember the days in which I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and it seems like God win, win, win. And God says, you just keep praying. You just keep being patient because the Bible says that patience will have its perfect work. Sometimes God does not want us to have something just like that because we're not ready for it. But you take people that are seasoned veterans of prayer, seasoned veterans of waiting because the work of God as it goes on, then that work must get bigger and people will come behind and say, well, how in the world are we going to do this? I'll tell you how we're going to do it. We're going to pray, we're going to keep working, and we're going to wait on God. And wait on God doesn't mean you just sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Wait on God is the same word for the wait that we, that we experience when someone comes to your table and says, can I take your order? They're waiting on you. Waiting doesn't mean they sit off on the side and you go, uh, can anybody take my order? You ever been someplace where you felt like you had to do that? Hey, can anybody fill my glass of water? Can, can, I get, can I get my, my meal over here? You know, and sometimes we've had service like that. But the perfect wait person is the person who just works and they're there. What can I get you? Uh, uh, what else do you need? And, and they bring things. And God says, I need people that will wait on me. They'll just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep going, keep going, keep going until God says, you know what, now, now's the time. And God is just a wonderful God. Hey, why has it been 2,000 years since God, since the Lord's return? That's if he came today. Do you know, we don't know that it could be another thousand years. You say, there's no way. We don't know that. What do you think they thought a thousand years ago? What do you think the apostles thought as one by one they're being executed and they thought, well, Lord, I, I figured you'd come back by now. I figured you'd rescue me from this situation. Imagine what was going through Paul's mind right before the guillotine took his head off, or the sword, really. Imagine what he thought when he laid his... When he laid, the old apostle laid his head down and said, Lord, I guess I thought you was going to come back and you might come back before they sever my head from my body. But you know what? They didn't. And thousands, and I guess maybe millions from that point on, have suffered the death at the hands of, of cruel people. And a lot of them have suffered at the hands of religious people. Uh, some things that, that people sometimes they just don't want to talk about. But I tell you, but between the time that the church started and, and history that went even up until about the 15, 1500s or so, many people died at the hands of religion. There's people that we would consider people that were our forefathers in the sense of spiritual forefathers, not going all the way back to the, to the, to the apostles, but there were people that if they had copies of the Bible, 
that would be confiscated, and they would, they, would, they would lose their life for that. This is right up until what we call the Great Reformation, and I'm not a Protestant. I believe there was people that, that always were not under the dupe of the Catholic Church. But I know this. I know people have been burned at the stake for the witness of Christ. There's been people that have been banished, people that have been, uh, you name it, it's been done. And a lot of that's been done all in the name of religion. But you know what? If we just patiently, patiently, patiently wait on God, which means we'll stay busy, we'll work, we'll pray, and uh, we'll get up on a wall wherever God's got us. Just get on your portion, whatever that is, and just say, Lord, I'm not going to come down. Because they want them to come down so the work would stop. And sometimes when people want to get you in some big old discussion, they're not interested in getting to the bottom of something. They just want to, they just want to frustrate you or delay something. Yesterday was out so well. Here's another one of these wonderful stories, but it, it is. It's unique how you, you find these things. But I knocked on a lady's door. If I could rank the top five people that I thought have treated me nice in an in a, in a encounter like that as far as how they talk, she would have been one of them. Hi, how are you? I said, well, I'm out here visiting from uh, Woodlawn Baptist Church. I'm the pastor. You show her that little card. And she goes, I could never come to your Baptist church. You say, you're exaggerating. No, I'm not exaggerating. That's the way she said it. And I thought, oh, my goodness, what is this? You know, now, I, I wanted to hear what her, what her story is. And she goes, well, I am the doctor. No, she says, I am the reverend doctor in whatever her name was. And I thought, well, okay, well, so she's claiming to be some, you know, preacher, I guess. And then she goes, uh, she said something, and then I said in my, in my mind, or maybe God says, you're not, you're not going to spend much time here because I don't want you to. God says, this is going to be a waste of time. She goes, I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, when did you ever get saved? You know, I figure she's a doctor reverend or a reverend doctor. She ought to, that terminology ought to be pretty, uh, you know, she'd know that real well. So when did you get, I said, when did you get saved? When did you get born again? And she goes, I don't believe in Jesus. And I'm saying that's the way she said it, probably nicer than that, because I'm a man, I can't say it as nice as she did. And she said something else, and I thought to myself, whoa, Reverend Doctor, don't believe in Jesus. And I could have sat there and said, you know what, uh, you know, just I could have went everywhere on that one. But I said, you know, this is a waste of time. Here's somebody that honestly, uh, in my opinion, probably I was talking to a demon-possessed lady. She acted so, so sweet, and yet she was so far off. And you might say, oh, preacher, you're, you're judging wrongly. Well, uh, I've got the Holy Spirit within me. I know, I know the way she responded, and it was very, very weird. I ju almost just as soon have met with a pit bull than to met with this lady. I'm, I'm serious because I had one not too long ago. I thought it was going to tear me to pieces. But it's interesting, though, that some people, though, and I've done this before. In my early days, somebody say something like that, man, I'd pull out 100 verses and try to convince them. But I knew who I was talking to, and you know what? I was doing a great work, so I just went on to the next one. And whoever the next one was, if they received it, they did. If they didn't, they didn't. So all I'm saying is, I believe God will give us the green light to help who we can, and sometimes you're just not going to get anywhere with anybody. And by design, they're trying to stop you, frustrate you, confuse you, intimidate you, whatever it is. And hers was really a weird one because she was so nice that... It was just bizarre nice. And I said to myself, this is a strange one. So I exited that one pretty quick. And, uh, you know, if somebody don't believe in Jesus and you're a reverend doctor or a doctor reverend, I don't know what, what where she got her degree or what that all means, but that's not worth two cents if you don't believe in Jesus. The Son of God, really? So I think we'll stop there because I'm not, you're not my uh, punching bag tonight. Well, let's bow our heads tonight, and here's the simple 